Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise, and I'm going to thank you very much for tuning in for a little bit of Texas history today. Now, most of y'all that have listened to this podcast for some length of time know that the world headquarters of Wise About Texas is in Houston, which is also home of the Astros, who were World Series bound after uh, crushing the New York Yankees last night at home. And everyone in Houston is very excited about that. We hope that they're going to make a little Astros history, a little Houston history, and a little Texas history. So good luck, Astros. also want to thank everybody for downloading and listening to this podcast. The download rate is increasing. Uh, we're well over 132,000 downloads in 67 different countries. And I continue to be amazed and uh, grateful that you all enjoy Texas history as much as I do. We're going to take a little bit of a turn in this week's episode, and I had the opportunity to present a speech at a symposium last week at Houston Baptist University, which dealt with art in the American West and how our Western art shaped our views of the West and the American identity. And today I'm going to talk about the subject of my presentation, who was an artist named William Ranney. Now, I will confess but I didn't know a lot about William Ranney when I was asked to present on his life and how his art shaped the American identity. But I found an interesting connection to Texas that it turns out really helped influence his art and in turn influenced the entire way that Americans saw themselves through art in the middle 1800s. And it really does make for an interesting story and shows how even in its earliest stages, Texas really did help shape the American identity. So we're going to go back to the early middle 1800s and get wise about Texas. Now I'm going to have to start this off by saying that uh, I certainly know art uh, that I enjoy looking at and art I don't think is so good, but art has never been one of the things that I know a lot about. I had a class in art history in high school because it was a requirement, not because it was an elective. Um, but I certainly appreciate the talent that artists have because I absolutely can barely draw a straight line. But as a historian, what historians should realize is that art is one medium by which the experience of an entire time period is expressed. And, And the study of that experience, of course, is the study of history. So you can't really study history without studying and recognizing how people express themselves, including, or perhaps even especially, through their art. And some artists are so talented and so attuned to the times that their art actually helps not only capture how the audience feels about themselves and maybe are not even consciously realizing that when they appreciate that artist, but um, also produces a body of work that really reflects the times that he lived in. And the artist that we're going to talk about today did that. His name was William Tiley Ranney, R-A-N-N-E-Y. And here's, I want to start by reading a small portion of his obituary in 1857 in the New York Times about William Ranney. The incidents of his life though simple and characterized by no marked vicissitudes, imply a resolute determination in pursuit of his art rarely met. In his death, American art has experienced a severe loss as his specialties were those in which he had no competitor and can have no successor. The New York Times wrote that about William Ranney uh, when he passed away. So he had a fairly short career but truly captured uh, the spirit of America during his time, and was a pi- he was himself was a pioneer in the body of work we know today as Western art. William Rainey was born in 1813 in Middletown, Connecticut. In 1813, Middletown, Connecticut was a very prosperous port city, uh, but by the early 19th century, well, late 18th century, 1700s, it was a prosperous port city. By the time that Rainey was born, it had declined. Um, he was born, uh, as I mentioned, 1813. The, the tensions with the British that led up to the War of 1812 really hurt Middletown as a port, and it never really recovered. Um, Ranny, at a young age, moved to live with his uncle William Knott in Fayetteville, North Carolina. 
Now, one source I found stated that his Ranny's father, was, who was a ship captain from Middletown, was lost at sea when Ranny was 16. I haven't been able to confirm that. But in any event, what we do know is that he moved to Fayetteville, North Carolina, to live with his merchant uncle and apprentice as a tinsmith. And during this time, he began sketching the scenes in North Carolina that he saw. And he also began trying to save money, intending, we believe, to become an artist. He moves back to New York in 1833 and may have begun studying art at this time, although surprisingly, because we think of New York as such as having a thriving art scene, there was not really a thriving art scene at this time and no art schools that we know of. But somehow he began uh, striving to improve his work Uh, But that didn't exactly work out right away. He ended up having to work as an assistant for an architect, which apparently stifled his creativity. And out of money and out of prospects, he did what a lot of people did back then, and we're up to 1836. And that's why he's the subject of a Texas history podcast. He moved to Texas. Now, in 1836... um, the war after the revolution, after the Battle of San Jacinto, you could move to Texas, you could enlist in the army, and you would not only be paid, although as we know, the Republic of Texas wasn't just uh, flush with money, but you would be given what Texas had a lot of, and that was land. So we had a lot of people moving to Texas to, uh, because land would have been instant uh, prosperity to some degree. So Ranny traveled to New Orleans and enlisted to come to Texas, and he came to Texas as a, um, with a group of New Orleans volunteers and served under a caption, Captain James Hughes. Now, he enlisted uh, with a captain named Hubble, but Hughes was his captain when he finally made it to Texas in May of 1836 after the Battle of San Jacinto. He was stationed at Victoria. He spent some time at Velasco and around Caney Creek, and uh, he served a what was then a standard six-month enlistment and was paid $48. And uh, I have his rece- a copy of the receipt for his $48 payment, and he was given some land. But important for our purposes is the fact that his widow later wrote about Ranny's life and said that while he was in Texas, he began making sketches of the scenes that he saw and what he would have seen, of course, in 1836 Texas, immediately post-revolution. He would have seen trappers. He would have seen uh, people from all over the country trying to come to Texas and, and seek their fortune. He would have seen soldiers. He would have seen intrepid frontiersmen. And those figures would populate the work of artists trying to capture the West during this time. But Ranny was one of the few and one of the only to have seen it firsthand. And so that time in Texas really influenced him and added an authenticity to his work later. In 1837, uh, his enlistment over, he went back to New York and was able to become more serious. He had his first exhibition in 1838. He listed himself in New York City directories as a portrait artist and, uh, It bears mention at this point that we don't know for sure whether Ranny ever had any formal training. The way you, uh, what would have been considered essential for a great artist at that time would have been some overseas training, and he had none of that and no indication that it ever occurred. Uh, And we don't even know that he had formal training in New York. You look at the quality of his work, you would think uh, that he had to have had some formal training at some point, but there aren't any records. Um, Well, he did uh, get a little bit of success in New York, but not enough apparently for him. He moves back to Fayetteville, North Carolina, again advertising himself as a portrait painter. This is around 1840. By 1843, he was moving back to New York. Now, at this point, New York had more of a serious art scene. He established um, his household. He got married. He moved with his wife to West Hoboken, New Jersey, which is now Union City, New Jersey. And he became a very prolific painter of Western scenes. Remember again that his time in Texas is what gave him uh, the background to really do this as well or better than anyone at the time. Here's what one critic in New York, and he began, Ranny began to have some critical success. Here's what one critic 
wrote, quote, We learn that Ranny has traveled west and therefore understands his subject, which, by the by, is more than we can say of all our painters. Close quote. So Rainey had finally achieved his dream of being an artist full-time, and the critics were recognizing the fact that he had been to Texas, and that lent an authenticity to his work that apparently no other painter of the time had. Now, living in New Jersey at that time would have been living in a rural area, not uh, too terribly dissimilar from the swampy country in North Carolina where he had come from, and he he would have had uh, plenty of inspiration uh, during this time, of course, New York was growing, and so we had the start of people wanting the clean air and open spaces of the countryside, which continues to this day. And American sporting culture really began to flourish uh, during this time. People started thinking about habitat cultivation for wildlife. They started talking about wildlife preservation. We take those things for granted today. We hear about them all the time. But Ranny was there when all of those ideas were first coming to fruition. Um, Ranny uh, sold his art. There was there was an interesting uh, phenomenon at this time in New York, something called an art union. It was kind of a co-op, and the art union would sign up subscribers or members, and they'd pay a fee. The art union would take the money and would buy art from the artists of the area to support them. And then at the end of the year, they would have a drawing, and everyone present would have a chance to win some of the paintings that the art union had accumulated during the past year. And during that year, those paintings would have been distributed to the public. So this was a way that the public could not only participate uh, by, by perhaps winning a painting for their own, uh, but they had a place to go and see these artists work. And then, of course, the artists had a place to sell their work. The American Art Union was one of Ranny's big supporters, and it had over 18,000 members. So this was not a small enterprise. So Ranny became very popular, and he began to produce a fairly extensive body of work. Now, I realize in a podcast, it's very difficult to talk about what painters are painting when you can't see it. So I'm going to talk for a few more minutes about what he did and why it was important and where it fit. And then I want you to go to the website, wiseabouttexas.com, where I'll put images of these paintings up, and you can see what I'm talking about. There were uh, three subjects that I thought really captured what Ranny was doing and the effect that it had on the population. The first was the American Revolution. He painted several scenes of the American Revolution. Now, in the 1840s and 50s, which is when Ranny was working, were about 70-ish years from the Revolution. We've also, he produced some revolution, Revolutionary War paintings right after the end of the Mexican War, which of course occurred uh, because Texas joined the Union. And as we've learned during the course of this podcast, the ideas that were expressed during the Texas Revolution and the subsequent Mexican War were very, very similar to the ideas expressed during the American Revolution. Comparisons were drawn consistently by the Texan fighters themselves to the American Revolution and the spirit of freedom. And so the history of the American Revolution would have just been forming in the collective consciousness of America in the 60 to 70 year uh, period after the revolution. And Ranny began painting uh, scenes from that. One that I'll put up, First News of Lexington, captures uh, the idea that the Minutemen rallied to the call for independence, not unlike the Texas Revolution he um, would have heard all about, uh, recruiting for the Continental Army, which demonstrated uh, the idea that we were organized and were signing up a more serious army uh, to fight the British. Uh, he painted something called Tory Escort, which showed, uh, captured the fact that hundreds of thousands of colonists, in fact, were loyal to the British crown. Uh, that also happened during the Texas Revolution, and we called the Mexican loyalists Tories. In fact, there was an area right uh, east of San Jacinto called Tory Hill. Uh, he painted another uh, painting called Marion Crossing the Petey. Now, Francis Marion, otherwise known as the Swamp Fox, a name bestowed upon him by the British general who was tasked to find him and kill him, Uh, that British general never could find Francis Marion, so he simply gave up. Um, That captures the guerrilla fighter in the Carolinas, and he was uh, certainly became a national hero, but was a serious regional hero at the time 
that Ranny was spending so much time in the Carolinas, so he would have learned a lot about him. And one other painting that he did uh, on the American Revolution was called Veterans Returning from the War, 1776, which captured, um, you know, the idea of, of veterans coming home from victory and captured uh, that they were very happy to do that, but also war was very hard and took a toll on them. And, and those are popular pictures um, throughout the American history. Uh, you have the sailor kissing the girl in Times Square after World War II, and nowadays the modern videos are soldiers coming back from Afghanistan or Iraq, perhaps surprising their kids or family. I love those videos. So that's a subject that uh, has always been popular uh, for Americans, and, and Randy captured that back in 1848. Um, he then painted a series of pictures celebrating the expansion westward. He painted one called Boone's First View of Kentucky. The interesting part of that picture is that everyone has a rather bored look on their face as if they always expected to discover such fertile land in the West and occupy it, the, embodying the idea of manifest destiny. A couple other pictures he painted about uh, trappers. Now, trappers and mountain men were some of our early legendary heroes. And Davy Crockett sort of fits into that a little bit. He was one of the early national celebrities that we had. But this character of the trapper and the mountain man really embodied for the audience the ideal of the American making it on his own, that no danger was too great for him to face and conquer. Um, and Granny captured that with some paintings of, of mountain men, one called The Pipe of Friendship, where mountain men meet on the trail and... and uh, discuss what they were doing. There were a couple of uh, interesting paintings, one called Trapper's Last Shot, where you have the action occurring off the frame and the trapper facing down Indians, uh, which of course would have been a very important subject and exciting subject for the audience. He painted one called The Wounded Trapper, where the trapper appears to be alone and thrown from his horse, which would have of course been a very, very serious situation. And then uh, he captured scenes of daily American life, uh, lots of sporting pictures, hunting pictures. He had one that was really one of my favorites called The Fowler's Return, which, again, the action's happening outside the frame, and the dogs await eagerly for their master to return. It's a great picture if you love uh, hunting. And he was one of the early ones to popularize that genre. Um, and then he painted a lot of pictures about pioneers moving west because the Mountain men and the trappers led the way, but it was really the pioneer families that settled the West for America. And he uh, painted one called Crossing the Ferry, which would have been a scene that repeated often in Texas, especially with our rivers. Now, when he painted it, he was painting the Carolinas. But um, Texas, some of our early successful businessmen were, were ferry boat operators. One of the first things that someone who wanted to build a town would do is build a ferry. And many of the roads the, in the area, what I'll call the area of the revolution, say San Antonio East uh, to San Jacinto, a lot of the roads today cross the Brazos and cross the Colorado at old ferry crossings. Um, indeed, the Lynchburg Ferry established in 1822 still runs to this day uh, between the San Jacinto battleground and uh, the other side of Burnett Bay or the ship channel now. So you can ride a a ferry today that started in 1824, 1822. That's a very important part of commerce, and he captured that. Um, he had a painting called The Pioneers, which which celebrated the families that struck out to the West. He had um, he had one that, that I think moves me more than any other uh, that he painted called Prairie Burial, where a pioneer family is burying one of their children. And I think that has been, uh, that is, captures the pioneer experience almost like no other. But that painting really is about the survivors um, who, despite facing the greatest tragedies they can imagine, persevered and settled the West for America. All of those paintings and their popularity would have taught people in the East not only what it was like in the West, and that's the only way they were going to find out other than oral histories or perhaps some writings which really were not occurring at that time, but uh, it would have shown them what it was like, but it also would have shown them, it would have created legends, the, the romance, even in tragedy, uh, that we as humans love, 
uh, that idea would have been created in the minds of the viewers in our first legends and our first heroes were born, the veterans of the revolution, the intrepid mountain men, the pioneer families that risked it all to go west. And Ranny was there at the beginning, and it was his experience in Texas that really shaped his ability to create that identity in the minds of his eastern audience. Unfortunately, Rainey contracted tuberculosis. He died when he was only 44. He had a lot of work unfinished, uh, some of which was finished by other artists. They had a huge sale to benefit Rainey's family, and artists of the day, uh, over 100 of them, donated paintings to this sale. They raised $7,100 for his family, which today would have been 185000 or so. Um, but William Rainey really was the embodiment of the American identity. His talent and ambition and his hard work made him successful. He was self-taught, and uh, he reflected that American identity in his paintings. Now, the ultimate question is whether Rainey's work created an American identity, or was he just responding to an identity that was already forming in the public's mind? Unfortunately, his untimely death will leave that question unanswered. But I'm going to put the paintings that I mentioned up on the website. I'm going to put a couple of more up there with some comments. Patrons of the show, I'll put even more over there uh, with some comments on them. And I hope you will go to the website, wiseabouttexas.com, and check those paintings out and decide for yourself uh, how you thought William Ranney shaped the American identity. Now, it's going to be a little bit difficult to talk about getting there. Uh, there is a William Ranney book that you can order, and that will take you uh, to his paintings without you having to travel around the country. I can tell you the uh, Buffalo Bill Historical Center in Cody, Wyoming, has some of his paintings. I believe the Eamon Carter Museum in Fort Worth has one or two, and uh, his prints are available. So I hope you, uh, instead of going to see a, a site where a particular historical event occurred with this episode, I hope you will go out and try to look at some of the art of William Ranney. And that wraps it up for another episode of Wise About Texas. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, please follow the show on our Facebook page, Wise About Texas. We're on Twitter and Instagram at Wise About Texas. And go out and do something for Texas today. Until next time, God bless Texas, and we'll see you down the road.